So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning to Anders Park in Budapest. It is my pleasure to start this fourth event in the series on Central European countries' policy regarding the Eastern Partnership region. This is the first of five modules included in the project Advanced Reforms in Armenia with Visegrad for Know How. And it's my pleasure to welcome today a very prominent Hungarian expert, Anders Ratz, who is currently a senior fellow of the Robert Bosch Center for Central and Eastern Europe, Russia and Central Asia. And without further delay, I may ask him to start the presentation on Hungarian perspective on the Eastern Partnership. In the meantime, it's possible to ask questions via chat on Zoom, and later on there will be also time for questions asked verbally, so please feel free to participate actively in the discussion. Uh, so, welcome Andras, and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for, uh, for hosting me. It's a real pleasure to return to Armenia even though only virtually in the context of the coronavirus pandemic, but hopefully we will have time and opportunity to change that in the future. So my name is Andras Schratz. Uh, right now I work at the German Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin, Germany. Currently I'm on holiday in Budapest, uh, my native Hungary. And here what I'm going to say in, in some 30 minutes is a Hungarian perspective on the Eastern Partnership region by providing also the necessary historical context as well, in which helps understanding the developments and the non-developments. Everything what I see here constitutes solely and exclusively my own personal opinion. So it shall not be considered as an official position of either my workplace or uh, my home country, just only personal opinion. Uh, I prepared PowerPoint presentation as well. It's a lot more detailed, which I'm that I'm actually going to than I'm actually going to say. The reason why I prepared it more detailed because there are so many historical things, conceptual things, which might help you later uh, if uh, you need to dig deeper into Hungarian neighborhood policy. So let me try to share my screen. Uh, no, it seems to be, Armin, that I cannot share my screen. It seems that the host has disabled the screen sharing. So please activate it for me. Uh, it should be possible now. Okay, uh, now it seems to be fine. Let me, okay. What do you see now? Do you see the PowerPoint? Uh, we may still see you, but maybe you should. Now you should yes. be able to yeah, see a PowerPoint. Yes. Do you see a PowerPoint? It's, yes, it, now it shows a PowerPoint presentation. Not the slide view yet, just the PowerPoint. I cannot hear you, Armin. Do you see the PowerPoint? Uh, I, yes, I do. So you see that Hungary and the Eastern Partnership, July. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Then it functions. Uh, and you can see my ugly face as well. Uh, well, so a smaller screen, at least. Not <laughs> ugly, but, uh, well, I, yes, okay, on a so smaller screen, I, we can see each other. As Perfect. Well. Right. So it's good. Then, then let's, let's proceed. So uh, in terms of contents, I would like to say a few words about Hungarian foreign policy identity in general and the role of Eastern Europe in it. Not just the Eastern Partnership region, but Eastern Europe in general, you will, you will understand why. Thereafter, uh, we will move from identity to particular foreign policy. So the second part, we're going to briefly discuss the role and place of Eastern Europe in Hungary's neighborhood policy. And thereafter, we move to part four, part three and part four. Uh, so Hungarian neighborhood policy in the Eastern Partnership context. And of course, 2014, constitutes a breaking point. 2014 constitutes an important point of change because of the breakout of the conflict in Ukraine and Russia's illegal annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. While uh, in the bilateral tracks of 
Hungarian neighborhood policy, 2014 has not always been a breaking point. Generally, it's still useful to, 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 to use it as, as a point of delimitation. I mean, why did I say that 2014 is not necessarily a breaking point? You all know very well, just as I do, that let's say in Hungary-Armenia relations, the unfortunate breaking point has been 2012, not 2014. I mean, that's a part of case. I will speak a bit more on that. But nevertheless, for the purpose of providing a general overview, it's useful to use 2014 as a breaking point. So, few words about Hungarian foreign policy identity in Eastern Europe. Let me show you a few maps. Uh, on the map, on the left, the geographical map, you see the Carpathian Basin, and inside the Carpathian Basin is basically today's Hungary. Part of Slovakia, part of Romania, but today's Hungary lays inside the Carpathian Basin. In the historical context, uh, almost for 900 years, Hungary has been a lot bigger country. Incorporated back then the territories of today's Slovakia, uh, part of today's Romania, part of today's Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, even part of today's Austria. So for 900 years, Hungary has been a lot bigger country. Uh, but borders matter in terms of foreign policy. Ever since the Hungarian state was founded in 1000, and of course, I mean, compared to Armenia, Hungary is a young state, uh, still in Central Europe, a thousand years history is, is, is moderately good. The important thing to understand that, for, that historically, Hungarian foreign policy always concentrated to the southern direction, not to the east. To the east, if you look at the geographical map, here where I'm pointing, uh, the northeastern Carpathian Mountains, now in, in, in Ukraine's territory, the northeastern Carpathian Mountains have been the historical border of Hungary almost for a thousand years. Hungarian foreign policy very rarely crossed the Carpathians. It's such a strong geographical natural border that there was no real reason or even resource to do anything on the other side of the Carpathians. Uh, usually danger came from the other side of the Carpathians like the Mongol invasion in the 13th century and the, the Soviet army a bit later. Uh, but for Hungarian foreign policy, the main direction has historically been the south, not the east. I mean, if you remember, of course, the Austro-Hungarian Empire possessed the, ter the territory called Galicia of today's Ukraine, which is the Lviv and Ivano-Frankivsk regions of today's Ukraine. But Galicia, and the Zakar, but Galicia was administered from Vienna, not from Budapest. Budapest has had nothing to do with uh, the territories on the other side of the Carpathian Mountains. So it's important to understand that historically, we have a very strong border, that natural border that has separated us from the East. And when you speak about East uh, in Hungarian language, it's an undefined concept. I mean, when, when we speak about East, very many people mean different things of what belongs to the East and what doesn't. If you ask the average Hungarian uh, whether China is included in the East, of course. Is Russia included in the East? Of course. How about the Caucasian countries? Well, many Hungarians haven't even heard about the Caucasian countries. Is uh, Tunisia belonging to the East? Most Hungarians would tell you yes, even though Tunisia lay, lies actually west, southwest from Hungary. So the very concept of what, what East means is undefined, mostly actually because of the lack of close historical connections. And various discourses differ. Let's say when you speak about the role of Russia, foreign ministry considers Russia, it's not part of the East, but Russia is separate. Academic discourse for scholars like myself uh, Russia is usually handled separately from, from Eastern Europe. The EU, same. Public discourse, more or less yes, more or less no. Uh, it's, uh, it's something hard to define, but we don't have definite consensus on what a wording means. And of course, in 2010, when Prime Minister Viktor Orban's government came to power, uh, he announced the doctrine of Hungary's turning towards the East, so rebalancing Hungary's foreign policy, 
this was the very famous slogan, Eastern winds are blowing, so Hungary shall sail to the east. <laughs> the fun part, uh, it took almost half a year for the government to realize that just imagine a ship. If you have eastern wind, you cannot sail to the east. With eastern wind, you usually sail to the west. Uh, and since then, the doctrine has changed. Uh, since then, it's called Eastern Opening Doctrine. But this Eastern Opening has been present in Hungarian foreign policy ever since 2011, 2010, 2011. And the problem with, with these uncertain interpretations, it's, this was just a bit too much. Uh, this is the important part to understand. You already heard the language, uh, lecture about Poland. And probably Wojciech Przybylski told you that in Polish language, there is a separate word for Eastern Europe. In Polish language is called the Wschód, the East, which means the historical Polish territories, which have once belonged to Poland. So in Polish language, you have a separate concept for what East means. Nothing like so, this in Hungary. So, excuse me, so you mean the parts of Ukraine and Belarus currently? Yes, in the Polish case, yes. Uh, Yes. Chris, and, part, and, and Lithuania, yeah. and Lithuania, part of Lithuania. So uh, in, a, in a Hungarian case, we have nothing like this. We have a separate word for those parts of the Hungarian Empire, the former Hungarian Empire, which now belong to, 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 to other countries, Slovakia, Romania, all that. But for the East, we do not have, do not have such a concept. And when you speak about the conceptual questions, the South Caucasian countries are unfortunately not even present in the Hungarian foreign policy consciousness. Uh, even the Baltic states, we have problems about interpreting, again, not the official discourse, but the public discourse. Whether Baltic states uh, constitute part of Eastern Europe or something else. And even though the Baltic states joined the European Union together with us in 2014, sorry, 2004, my bad, 2004. Many Hungarians would still think about Lithuania or Latvia or Estonia, or former Soviet Union, oh, it's Eastern Europe, it's something different. No, guys, it's Eastern Europe, it's not us. But in terms of thinking, in terms of concepts, uh, the, the, the meaning of East, and actually even the meaning of West in Hungarian foreign policy is, is quite uncertain. And a few more things to understand. Uh, Particularly since 1920, so since historical Hungary has been cut apart after the First World War in the Treaty of Trianon, Hungarian foreign policy has always been concentrating a lot to the situation of the Hungarian minorities living in the neighboring countries. And since 1989, since the democratic transition, taking care of the Hungarian minorities abroad has been a defining element of the foreign policies of each and every Hungarian government. Let it be a socialist liberal government, let it be a rightist conservative government, each and every government cared about the Hungarian minorities living abroad. This is a very strong connection. I don't know much about Armenia, um, but you in Armenia probably understand the importance of connection to the diaspora. Uh, in the Hungarian case, all diaspora lives a lot closer to us physically just right on, on, on the other side of the border. So these uh, close relations to, the, to, the, my, my, to our national minorities abroad has been a defining factor. And here comes the problem when it comes to Eastern Europe. It's, I mean, if you look at the Eastern partnership countries, there is no Hungarian minority there, except of Ukraine. In Ukraine, there are approximately 130,000 Hungarians. But in Belarus, in Moldova, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, there is no Hungarian minority there. So this actually weakens the visibility of these countries in Hungarian foreign policy. Because we care so much about minorities, minority issues has always been one of our, our defining factors. So in countries when there are no Hungarian minorities, it's, it's one less connection. Again, this is different to Poland. There are lots of Polish uh, minorities living in Ukraine, lots of Polish minorities in Belarus. You find Polish groups uh, in many other countries of the former Soviet Union. This is not the case you know, with, uh, with Hungary. So behind Hungarian Eastern policy, 
these very strong minor relative motivations are missing, except Ukraine, about Ukraine we will talk later. And another thing, it's not that just we are not there, but others are not here either. Hungary has no significant minorities from the Eastern European countries. Uh, since the Treaty of Trianon, so since uh, 1920, Hungary is a country of approximately 10 million people, and a half, uh, with 13 uh, minorities, but all these minorities are very, very small. I mean, uh, we have Ukrainians, we have Ruthenians, but these are only a few thousand people. So this is not a visible minority. Let's say in, in the case of Belarus and Polish people, Belarus has a population of 9.5 million. There are 400,000 Polish minority, strong, organized, visible group. The Ukrainian minority in Hungary is not a visible group. Small, disorganized, nice people, but only very few of them. And I mean, because they are so small, uh, Hungary has always, have, has always had a very liberal minority policy. Because these small groups, they do not constitute, cannot constitute any kind of danger, any kind of problem. So Hungarian legislation has always been liberal. We provided them uh, with all the necessary minority rights since the new constitution has been adopted in the beginning of the 2010s. Uh, some of the national minorities can be present even in the parliament. For example, the German minority has a spokesperson in a, the par a member of the parliament actually with voting rights. So this is this is not yes. the case like excuse like Latvia and Estonia. Excuse me, the all the minorities as well. I guess the Armenians also had this. Yes, we will speak about so the Armenians. Yes, yes, uh, Armenian. I mean, okay, this is a technical detail. They, they Each and every minority has a spokesperson, a so-called so solo, in yeah. the parliament. This Those people actually, can be there but cannot vote. Armenian minority has a so solo, a spokesperson. This person sits in the parliament, can be present, uh, can talk in the discussions, but cannot vote. Uh, the only exception is the German minority, because they are a lot bigger and they manage to elect a proper member of the parliament. Uh, a person named Imre Ritter, uh, an ethnic German from Hungary, he has a voting right. Smaller minorities, uh, they do not have a right to vote, but they have the right for discussion. And it's very important that Armen added this, uh, this detail. It actually, it's actually a good example for many other countries that even the smallest minorities are allowed to have their spokesperson so so in the parliament. No voting right, but the person can be there and can represent the interest of his or her minority. But again, because of Eastern Europe or the Eastern Partnership region, has been present in Hungary in the minority sense only in a very limited scale. This does not constitute much of a foreign policy motivation factor. Ukraine is again an exception. And just, I, I cannot emphasize uh, strong enough that historically the focus of foreign policy has always been the South because of geographic reasons. And as a result, Hungary has very limited common past with, with countries of Eastern Europe. I mean, geographical separation about that we, we spoke about already. We have no common institutions. We have no common legal traditions. Even those parts of Ukraine which belong to historical Hungary were administered from Vienna, not from Budapest. And when it comes to the Soviet past, unlike, let's say, your Baltic friends, Hungary was not part of the Soviet Union. Hungary was a satellite state, but not part of the Soviet Union. So our common past is much more limited with the Eastern Partnership countries than, let's say, the past what, what Baltic countries have. Plus, uh, in the communist era, in 1956, Hungary had an uprising against the Soviet Union. And even though the uprising was defeated, as each and every uprising in the Soviet bloc was, after that, after 1956, uh, the Hungarian regime got liberalized a lot. Soviets were surprised by the uprising. Uh, Somebody is trying to request remote control of my screen. Uh, sorry, I declined that. Uh, if you have anything to add, please, please use the comment section. Okay, don't try to remote control my screen. 
Okay. Uh, and because of the system has been much more liberal than in other communist countries, uh, this actually created further distance from Hungary from the former Soviet Union. We were the only country in the former, in the former Soviet bloc who were allowed to travel to the West. Only in every third year, only with small money, only for a short time. But thinking of the Hungarian head, let's say 1970 or 1980, if you could travel to Austria, would you travel to the Soviet Union? Of course you wouldn't. Everybody happily traveled to, the Aust to Austria, everybody looked to the West, not much to, uh, to the East. And the last thing, language. Unlike Poland, unlike Slovakia, unlike Czech Republic, Hungarian language is not Slavic. It's a finno ugric language. For us, learning Slavic languages is hard. Uh, even if we learn a Slavic language, we will always have a strong accent. I, mean, I speak Russian, I speak uh, Polish, but with terrible, terrible strong accent. I can never get rid of it. Uh, so linguistic ties are not present. And even though in the communist times, learning Russian was compulsory, <laughs> teaching Russian was highly unsuccessful. I, mean, I learned Russian way after the communist trans and the, the post-communist transition. So linguistic ties are not there. Many people in the Baltic states, even if they are ethnic Lithuanians, ethnic Latvians, ethnic Estonians, they learned Russian, they speak Russian, or at least they understand Russian. In Hungary, nobody. I mean, Russian, in, I mean, I'm teaching it, I have been teaching at the university for quite a while, so I know these numbers. If you ask Hungarian students which foreign language would like to learn, English is the first priority, German, second, Italian, Spanish, Chinese, ta 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 ta, lot of languages. Russian comes somewhere in the very late. We don't have linguistic connections. And this is also, this is something that doesn't really help uh, fostering closer ties. So, the Hungarian neighborhood policy, this is going to be quick. Uh, for Hungary, neighborhood policy before 2004 meant all the countries around us. So, I mean, the concept of neighborhood has been changing. After Hungary joined the European Union, together with the Central European countries, neighborhood back then meant Romania, a country which was not yet member of the EU, uh, Ukraine and the South uh, and, and the Western Balkans countries. So the physical neighbors of Hungary, which were not members of the EU. After 2007, when Romania also joined, the definition of neighborhood changed again. Uh, and after Croatia joined, again changed, Generally speaking, in Hungarian language, if you speak about neighborhood policy, some say chart political, it does not mean the EU's neighborhood policy. It means the physical neighbors of Hungary. Uh, and I mean, only Ukraine is the overlapping point. So conceptually, the way, I mean, all discourse is quite far away from, from the EU discourse. Here's a comparative chart of, uh, of the Hungarian discourse and the EU discourse. We don't have time for that. Uh, and I mean, just another conceptual thing to add, but it's useful before we go to the practical parts. Because we have so limited connections with Eastern Europe, we don't have such a sense of solidarity, which has been one of the motivating factors, let's say, behind Poland's Eastern policy. Or, or the Baltic states' eastern policies. In the Hungarian case, very limited solidarity has been present. Solidarity as a, as a, as a, as a value-based motivation of, uh, of foreign policy has been present only vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, and even that one is limited. So to the other Eastern European countries, other Eastern partnership countries, Hungary's engagement is not based on solidarity, it's not based on something we deeply feel. It's based on pragmatic interest, need for stability, and also uh, the, the normative dimensions so of the EU engagement. And one more thing, this has been very important until 2014. It has been present even since then, not to alienate Russia. I mean, the Russia factor is a key, uh, key element in Hungary's policy towards the Eastern, uh, towards the Eastern neighborhood. And Particularly since the colored revolutions, you know, color revolution in Ukraine, color revolution, uh, sorry, Georgia, Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, these were the successful ones uh, in the first wave. 
and thereafter unsuccessful revolutions in Belarus, Moldova, Uzbekistan, uh, still in the first wave, a change of power in, uh, in Armenia with President Pashinyan coming to power. This was something uh, many in Russia constituted as a revolution. Uh, Russia is usually, uh, Russia usually gets irritated by, by the promotion of democratic ideas, the promotion of democratic norms. And if you remember the 2000s, the era of color revolutions in, in the Eastern Partnership region, Eastern Neighborhood region, Russia was very nervous about what was going on in Ukraine, what was going on in Moldova, what was going on in Georgia. Hungary did not want to be part of that. Hungary never got engaged in exporting democracy. There had been a few very small initiatives, but nothing like what Poland did or the Czech Republic has been doing in the protection of human rights. The promotion of values is very limited uh, in Hungarian foreign policy, almost non-existent, because we did not intend and do not intend to alienate Russia or to make Russia nervous. The Russia dimension is a key defining factor. Uh, so the only value-based motivation, if it's value-based uh, in terms of solidarity, the only thing Hungary can really export uh, in terms of knowledge and, is the transition experience. How, how much did it, I mean, what did it take to, to transit from an authoritarian state to a democratic state in 1989? What it means in, private, in terms of privatization, in terms of institution building, in terms of democratization, all that. So mostly what Hungary has been doing in terms of transferring the transition experience in order not to alienate Russia, we do neutral transfer of experiences. We do not speak much about values. We never did. And of course, since 2010, since Viktor Orban came to power, uh, Hungary's rating in various uh, democracy rankings has been deteriorating. In the Freedom House ranking, Hungary is already only a partly free country, the only one in the EU actually, uh, or sorry, in Central Europe. So since 2010, we particularly do not speak about democratic values, but we do not, but we did not speak about democratic values even before 2010 too much. We did not want to alienate the Russians. We did not want to, ang to make the Russians angry. Uh, Hungary has not got engaged in identity-related conflicts. Again, with the exception of Ukraine, we will speak about Ukraine later. So what we transfer mostly is practical experience and technical knowledge. I mean, a lot of training programs, a lot of highly technical things. I mean, to give you one example, Romania has been doing a lot of identity-related projects in Moldova. Hungary doesn't care about identity. Hungary has been transferring let's say such technical experience like agricultural land registry system. Moldova has been using the agricultural land registry system which has been built by the Hungarians. This is neutral, ideologically neutral technical experience that we are happy to transfer. This logic dominates uh, Hungary's uh, transfer of experience all uh, towards the Eastern Partnership region. So all in all, our commitment towards Eastern Europe has been very differentiated and actually quite limited. With a lot of differentiations, again, before 2014. With Ukraine and Moldova, the commitment was partly organic, internally motivated. In Ukraine's case, anyway, is a direct neighbor, plus we have our minority there. Moldova was a trickier question. You may ask why Hungarian commitment to Moldova has been organically motivated? And the answer is something very Central European or very Eastern European. It's a joke. Like, the best neighbor is the neighbor of your neighbor. Hungary has had plenty of conflicts with Romania. So having Moldova as the other neighbor of Romania, it actually created a kind of a tie, a kind of a connection. But again, if you look at uh, Hungarian foreign policy documents to, uh, on, on Eastern Partnership region, let it be the foreign policy strategy, let it be the national security strategy, uh, all other such documents, there has been a strong differentiation and commitment towards Ukraine and Moldova 
has been very strong, very much internalized, supported in all the documents, particularly on Ukraine. Belarus has been a different story. Uh, before 2014, Hungary did not care much about Belarus. The limited commitment was not internally motivated. We've done it only because the EU requested us to do it. Uh, and before 2014, Belarus was, was hardly visible on the map of Hungarian foreign policy. Something similar with the South Caucasian countries. No historical connections, large geographical distance. Uh, South Caucasian minorities have not been present in Hungary except uh, the, the Armenian minority. Many Hungarians have never even traveled to South Caucasus, never even thought about it. Actually, an interesting game changer was when the airline Vizer opened the first direct flight between Hungary and Georgia. Of course, not to, to Tbilisi, but to Kutaisi airport. But it was really cheap. It's something many Hungarians took it as, okay, where to travel, where to travel, let's, let's try Georgia. And the Vizer direct flight, it actually really contributed to the deeper understanding of, uh, of Georgia, deeper I mean, understanding at all uh, towards, towards Georgia and basically put Georgia on, on the Hungarian foreign policy map. Because I mean, every citizen start, started to get practical experiences. However, engagement toward the South Caucasian countries has never been internalized. It's not something that we do it from our heart. It's not something that is value motivated. It has always been motivated by practical interests, mostly energy, when it comes to Azerbaijan and energy transit when it comes to Georgia. And the unfortunate story of Hungarian and Armenian relations has been a victim to that logic. And practical policies. Here, again, the main context has been towards the, I mean, the relations with Russia, not to alienate Russia. And this has affected all other foreign policies versus the Eastern Partnership regions. Uh, we don't have time for these. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer that. This we discussed already. So even so before 2014, most ties with Eastern Partnership countries, uh, and Hungary had good practical ties, but not too close ones. We had embassies uh, almost in all countries, Armenia was an unfortunate uh, exception. <laughs> Allow me a personal story, okay? Uh, in, two th in the summer of 2012, May, June 2012, Hungary was to open an embassy in Yerevan and Armenia was to open an embassy in Hungary because Hungary so far has been covered by the Armenian embassy in Vienna. In summer 2012, everything was ready. The Armenian side even had the ambassador already selected, that lady who could have been the ambassador to Budapest. Everything was ready for, in, for making bilateral relations a lot more intensive. And a lot of projects were prepared, a lot of projects were just ready for, for, for launch. And then came the Safarov case, 31st of August 2012. Everything was cut. We'll talk about that later. It was a really, really unfortunate story. But again, the Russia first attitude has been a dominant one. Minority issues have been present only in the Ukrainian case. Uh, and with Moldova and Ukraine, we had plenty of practical initiatives as well. But again, none of this was as intensive like the relations of Poland and Belarus would have been. Or Romania and Moldova. Hungary was always a small player in the East. Hungarian foreign policy has always concentrated on the Western Balkans, so to the South, and uh, not, much, not much to Eastern Europe. So all in all, one could summarize it, that Eastern partnership, yes, a priority, but no clear-cut concept and not much resources. Hungary has been president of the European Union in the first half of 2011. And during the Hungarian EU presidency, there was a plan to host the Eastern Partnership Summit. So Hungary was really preparing. But in the very end of 2010, it was decided that the Eastern Partnership Summit would be moved 
from spring 2011, so from the Hungarian presidency, to autumn 2011, so to the Polish presidency. Basically, Poland took over the Eastern Partnership Summit from Hungary. And then there was, when, and then the, it turned out that there would be no summit, no Eastern Partnership Summit during the Hungarian presidency. Budapest was quick and easy to just give up the commitment. Okay, if no summit is not important for the presidency, who cares? Let Poland does it. Let Poland do it. Again, because our commitment has not been really organic, not something value-based, not solidarity-based. Most of the commitment was given up very easily. We're um, back in the first half of, of 2011. And now we move to the practical stories. Last chapter was the situation after 2014. <coughs> Sorry. It's corona already. No, it's not. Um, the conflict in Ukraine changed everything in European security. You probably heard that a thousand times, so I'm not, I'm not going to, to, to repeat that. It changed how countries perceive Russia, it changed how countries perceive security guarantees, the value of security guarantees. It has been a game changer also in Armenia, as far as I know, yet before the 2016 war. So in Hungarian foreign policy, the Russia first attitude has been becoming a lot more differentiated than it was. On the one hand, we are still, in Central Europe, Hungary still has the closest relations with Russia. Hungary is engaged in a massive nuclear power plant project. That's a typo there. So power plant, the Pax nuclear power plant, which is going to be built by Rosatom from a Russian credit line. This has been creating a dependency in terms of finances, in terms of energy, in terms of technology, in terms of security. A massive dependence for, for decades to come. So if the nuclear power plant is going to be realized, we still don't know it, uh, Russia will have decades long, very, very strong positions in Hungary. So this story is still around. Fun fact. Uh, Russia made Hungarians sign the contract on Paksh literally a few weeks before the Crimea. So the revolution in Ukraine was already going on. It was already quite evident that President Yanukovych was to lose. Russia was already preparing for the invasion. But yet before, uh, Moscow made Hungarians sign the contract on the Paksh nuclear power plant. So on the one hand, Energy-related dependency, both in nuclear and gas, as well as business cooperation, is still there. It's still very important. However, since 2014, the whole story has, is becoming much more balanced because the security dimension is increasing its importance. Since 2014, Hungary has wholeheartedly supported NATO's commitment to strengthening the eastern flank, to enhanced forward presence, Hungary has contributing its air force to the monitoring of Baltic airspace. Uh, Hungary has been hosting two NATO units, one NATO force integration unit and the NATO's European heavy airlift wing is also stationed in Hungary, the military airport of Parma. Uh, and Hungary has been a massive contributor to, to NATO's various crisis management missions. So Hungary's NATO commitment is, is becoming stronger, has been becoming stronger since 2014. Besides NATO commitment, on the national level, Hungary has been conducting a large-scale, massive military modernization, something which has not been seen in the last at least 25 years. We are buying 44 Leopard tanks, supermodern Leopard 2A7 types from Germany. We are buying German-made self-propelled artillery systems, the Panzerhaubitze 2000. We're buying attack helicopters, transport helicopters, infantry weapons, a large-scale modernization is taking place. And Hungary has another type of dam. So uh, a few weeks ago, Hungary adopted a new national security strategy. It was high time to do so because the previous national security strategy was eight years old in 2012. The new national security strategy is different quite much from the previous one when it comes to Russia. 
in the previous strategy, 2012, the wording was, it's in our joint interest to have closer cooperation with Russia, um, to support the modernization of Russia, as Russia is a source of stability and all this. The new national security strategy, it basically uses NATO perception and NATO wording. Russia as a source of instability and potential military conflict. So the Russia first attitude is becoming a lot more differentiated. Economic and energy dependence is still there, uh, but, but the whole relationship is getting securitized. And NATO socialization, NATO connections, these prevail and these dominate. Hungary's foreign policy actually even vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. And when it comes to the Eastern partnership, because of the lack of deeply internalized value-based commitments, uh, inside the European Union, Budapest has been largely con con uh, conducting, following, supporting foreign policy. Budapest doesn't have many initiatives when it comes to the Eastern Partnership, but we support other states in their initiatives, particularly our Polish friends. So basically, in, with a bit of simplification, of course, uh, Budapest lets other countries take the lead. And because of essential security-related and trade-related interests, Hungary has been fully supportive to the association agreements with Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia, as well as the deep and comprehensive free trade area agreements. Budapest is happy uh, if, the East, the, if, if Eastern partnership countries are becoming more successful. Uh, Budapest is not, uh, I mean, Ukraine joining the DCFTA, it opens up immense trade opportunities also for Hungary. Georgia uh, and Moldova joining DCFT and having association agreements. It's very good opportunities for tourism, for agricultural cooperation, for, uh, for industrial export, a lot of things. So Hungary has been fully supportive to all these developments. Budapest never took the lead. Budapest never took the flag and ran forward, but supported countries which did. And following the same multilateral logic, Budapest, while not being too active, unilaterally. At the same time, Hungary is supportive to multilateral engagements, particularly of the Visegrad cooperation. So together with your Polish, Czech, and Slovak friends, uh, the Visegrad cooperation, and particularly the International Visegrad Fund, has been doing a lot in the, in the Eastern Partnership area, and Hungary is fully supportive. There is a new trend, and this is important to understand. <coughs> this is brand new. Uh, and it's an exception from the previous logic. In the last few years, Hungarian foreign policy started a new trend and started to elevate bilateral tensions to multilateral level. This is highly unprecedented in the European Union. This story is about Ukraine. We will soon speak about Ukraine. Usually in the European Union, if a country has a problem with a neighbor, they settle the problem bilaterally. It's very, very unusual if you try to blackmail or put pressure on your neighbor in, in the European Union, say, if you bring the problem up to the multilateral level. And it's a no-go if you do that by elevating the problem to the NATO level. Because NATO is not about solving bilateral problems. Sorry, please read, read the article, for the, the, the Washington reading. However, when it comes to tensions with Ukraine, Hungary did both. So we, had, we have had bilateral problems, we still have bilateral problems. Uh, and instead of keeping that, keeping them on bilateral level, Budapest decided to elevate the story on EU level and NATO level, basically by vetoing and blocking uh, Ukraine's closer cooperation with, uh, with NATO and also the EU. So using veto power, to, using multilateral veto power, to solve bilateral tensions. It's a new trend. It's a worrying trend. We don't really know where is it going to, to lead. But this is indeed present and it deserves closer attention. And country by country, quickly, Hungary-Georgia relations. Budapest and PDC have had no conflicting issues. And in terms of trade, the importance of the two countries are very moderate to each other. Uh, since Russia embargoed uh, 
uh, the import of Georgian wine, uh, Georgian wine export managed to reorient itself, uh, both to the European Union and actually Turkey. So since the Russian embargoes, you may find Georgian agricultural products in Hungarian shops and about tourism, uh, we already spoke, but still economic and trade relations between the two countries are really, really very shallow. Uh, however, Hungary has been active in providing technical assistance to Georgia in administrative issues, in uh, public administration issues. Plus, there are a few Hungarian companies actively investing in Georgia, mostly in the construction sector. Uh, since the war in Georgia in 2008, the European Union monitoring mission has been working on Georgian soil. Hungary is a regular contributor to this mission, the usual recent for this activity in Vienna. And since 2012, uh, because diplomatic relations between Armenia and Hungary have been suspended, uh, the embassy in PDC is covering Armenia as well, already for eight years. Uh, coming to Armenia, Hungary-Armenia relations have I mean, the bilateral political relations have been shallow. I mean, two far away countries, not too much interested in each other. However, in the minority sense and cultural sense, ties have been and actually are still present and strong. Uh, many prominent Hungarians are of, of Armenian descent. Uh, we have an Armenian minority visit, small but active. One of the universities has been engaged in archeological projects in, in Armenia. Uh, so relations were generally good between 2012. Then happened 31st of August 2012, the Safarov case. Question to the audience, uh, please raise your hand. Is there anybody who does not know what the Safarov case has been? Anybody just turn on your microphone and tell me if you do not know. Shall I speak about it in detail or do we all know it? Do not see the reply. This is interesting. So, anybody? Well, in Armenia, anybody knows about that. Everybody knows. That's and good. most people have opinion as well. So. so, that's good. The story in short Ramil Safarov, an Azerbaijani military officer in the framework of NATO partnership for peace exercise tried to murder two Armenian officers who were participating in the same exercise. One officer survived, uh, the other officer, Gurgan Margarian, uh, unfortunately died. Safarov was sentenced to uh, lifelong imprisonment in a Hungarian prison, but in 2012, Azerbaijan requested that Hungary transfer Safarov to an Azerbaijani prison. And here comes the fun part. Okay, it's more or less public doesn't matter much anymore. The Hungarian state administration was able to forecast that this is not a good idea. It's documented, it's public. The Hungarian state administration forecasted properly that Azerbaijanis were not going to keep their promise that they keep Safarov in prison. Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Foreign Affairs were all, all voiced their concerns that this is not a good idea. But the top political leadership decided, regardless, that proceed. So Safarov was transferred to Azerbaijan on the 31st of August, August 2012. The deal, the agreement was kind of an agreement. The Safarov would stay in Azerbaijan in prison for a bit more time and thereafter nicely transit, transported to a mental, I mean, a psychiatric institute, because Safarov is seriously, I mean, the person is mad. But on the 31st of August, 2012, to the utter surprise of Hungary, the Azerbaijani presidential aircraft requested a permission to enter Hungarian airspace. Safarov was carried home by President Ilham Aliyev's personal aircraft. And the picture down there, is when he landed. He landed in Baku. He was immediately, I mean, greeted as a national hero and immediately pardoned and released. From the Hungarian perspective, he was already out of the Hungarian state. He was already out of our hands. We could do nothing. 
literally nothing. 31st of August was a Friday. I remember because that time I worked in, in the state sector. On that very night, Armenian National Security Council had, had, had an extraordinary meeting, and then President Serge Sarkian uh, decided to suspend diplomatic relations with, Army, uh, with, with, with Hungary, which, which is an unprecedented move, but so was the Safarov case first. And second, exactly because relations were only moderately intensive, because we, had, we didn't have that much intensive relations, Armenia had to do something demonstrative, something big. But, we had, but, but because we had not much else, the only, basically the only thing that President Sarkian could do is to suspend diplomatic relations. An important detail, it's not breaking diplomatic relations. It's not about cutting diplomatic ties. It's only about suspending. On that very day in Yerevan, there was a protest in front of the Hungarian consulate. Another interesting detail. Uh, there was a protest, angry people took the streets, but Armenian police made sure that the consulate building was not harmed. Yerevan, the Armenian diplomacy, tried to, to keep the passion on a moderate level and tried to, to open channels or to maintain channels of communication. Since then, there have been many cases that Armenian diplomacy, of course, indirectly, indicated Hungary that, I mean, if you apology, I mean, a, a formal apology would be sufficient for restoring diplomatic relations. This has been indicated at least four times. Interesting element of the Safarov case, what you may not know, it was a top, it was a decision decided on the very top of the Hungarian government. When I say very top, I mean the very top. Uh, but the Hungarian public was not happy. There were massive protests against this decision. And in September, October, there were a few Hungarian delegations, NGO people, experts, uh, philosophers, historians who traveled to Armenia. Hungarian churches, the Catholic Church, the Reformed Church, and the Evangelic Church, they issued a joint declaration declaration of protest. The church declaration said it's not our competence to judge whether the decision was legal or not, but we are really sorry about what happened and we apologize. Armenian side indicated several times that a formal apology would be enough. Back then, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Hungary was Janos Martoni, an experienced career diplomat, one of the best diplomats Hungary ever had. And Foreign Minister Martoni replied to the Armenian messages that I'm ready to apologize. I, I did not agree with the decision. This decision was taken on the very top. I'm ready for an apology. But here comes practical diplomacy colleagues. Decision on the Armenian side was taken by the president, President Sarkia. So if the Hungarian side sends an apology only on the ministerial level, much lower, it's not enough. Protocol-wise, it's not enough. And from the Armenian side, it also would not be enough. In order to, to send an apology sufficient enough, probably that would need to be done on presidential or prime minister level. Understandably. It never happened. Uh, and it's unlikely that it would ever happen anytime soon. First, because certain regimes never apologize, certain political system never, never, never apologize. I mean, when it comes to regimes, did you ever hear Alexander Lukashenko apologizing? Did you ever hear Vladimir Putin apologizing? Never. I mean, certain countries never apologize. Uh, the Hungarian government is also unlikely to apologize. And because ties were limited, economic relations were very small. From the Hungarian perspective, loss is moderate from the government perspective. On the other hand, the whole thing was done because Hungary has had very high hopes regarding cooperation with Azerbaijan. We will move to that. Uh, so from a certain perspective, Hungary basically took up this loss vis-a-vis -vis Armenia in order to have better relations with Azerbaijan. 
An interesting element is that even though diplomatic relations are suspended, Hungary did not use the conflict, Hungary did not veto or block any Armenia-related initiatives in the, uh, in, the Euro, uh, in the Eastern Partnership. Hungary was fully supportive to Armenia's special agreement with the European Union. So even though in 2012, there's a lot of concerns that it might be problematic if an EU country has no diplomatic relationship with an Eastern Partnership country. In practice, it turned out that this is not a problem from the Eastern Partnership perspective. Hungary doesn't, have, doesn't want to escalate the conflict. Since then, again, there have been several messaging that a formal apology could foster the restoration of relations. Uh, the chance for repairing the relations is quite unlikely to happen anytime soon, and it clearly depends on the Hungarian side. <laughs> Safarov actually, uh, in the prison, he learned Hungarian to such an extent, he's translating Hungarian poetry to Azerbaijani. Some of his books are actually published uh, in, in Azerbaijan. I have a book of Safarov uh, in which he translated uh, Hungarian poetry to Azerbaijan. Yeah, he, that, that's uh, a very particular story. Not only poetry, but uh, a voice from Paul Street yes, as boy, well. Boys from Paul Street. Very, I mean, very famous novel. Is it, so, I mean, Safarov is, 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 is a very unique, uh, very unique figure in this whole story. Uh, but I wish the whole story wouldn't have happened at all. When it comes to Azerbaijan, the other end of the conflict, relations and ties before 2012 between Azerbaijan and Hungary were quite shallow. However, then uh, the perspective of Azerbaijan energy industry started to rise and you know, the Baku Jehind pipeline project, Azerbaijani uh, plans to export natural gas to the EU, the Agri project and all these. Plus back then Azerbaijan was really rich, literally swimming in oil money. Uh, Hungarian government has had really high hopes of importing energy from Azerbaijan, uh, investing Azer into Azerbaijan, getting Azerbaijani cap capital investing in Hungary. Uh, so there were really, really high hopes and intensive diplomacy between the two countries. And Budapest basically decided to transfer Safarov to Azerbaijan as a gesture of goodwill and as a gesture of demonstrating the commitment to closer relations between Azerbaijan and Hungary. Back then, uh, in connection, or after the Safarov case, there have been a lot of promises from the Azerbaijani side. Various Hungarian business circles were promised to have various business opportunities in Azerbaijan. Not that many of these got realized, in fact. But Safarov was already in Baku, so they... The interesting element is that between 2012 and 2015, 2016, Azerbaijani-Hungarian relations were really intensive, a lot of bilateral visits. Uh, President Aliyev was in Hungary, President, uh, Prime Minister Orban was in Baku. A lot of uh, very intensive bilateral diplomatic exchanges. However, you all know very well and much better than I do that from 2015, 2016, Azerbaijani ec economy has really started to suffer. Azerbaijani national currency, the manat basically collapsed, losing 30% of its value in a few days time. Thereafter uh, came the war in April uh, 2016 in, 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 in Karabakh. And all this economic instability and the protests uh, and the volatility of, of Azerbaijani currency, it basically caused Hungarian foreign policy to downgrade its hopes regarding Azerbaijan. By now, summer 2020, bilateral relations are not intensive at all. Most of Hungarian capital tried to come out of Azerbaijan. Uh, energy import hopes, even if it's not completely off the table, but became a lot less optimistic than they were. Five years ago, the picture looked a lot different. It's unlikely taking into account the domestic situation in Azerbaijan and also the low oil prices, which has been basically breaking the backbone of Azerbaijani economy, that, uh, that bilateral relations between Budapest and Baku would ever get back to the intensity 
like they had before. Relations with Moldova, we already spoke about that. Hungary has been one of, particularly in the, in the 2000s, Hungary has been one of the most engaged EU countries in Moldova. There was a certain moment uh, when the EU special representative was Hungarian, the commander of the EU border assistance mission was Hungarian, Hungary was operating the EU Common Visa Application Center in Chisinau, uh, <laughs> next to the Moldovan government at, at a certain period. Next to the Moldovan government, there was a Hungarian advisor, uh, a person who spoke perfect, impeccable Russian, but no Romanian. Uh, and in order to have this advisor understand everything, the Moldovan government had its sessions in Russian, in order to have the Hungarian colleague understand and contribute. So in, two, in the 2000s, Budapest was really strongly engaged in providing various forms of technical and political assistance to Moldova, but again, only neutral things. We did not get engaged in questions of identity, questions of policy, who is Romanian, who is Moldovan. It's not something that Budapest likes to get, uh, get engaged upon. But in terms of technical investments, Budapest has been, has been a very active player. In the, 2000, in the 2010s, however, this commitment slowly faded away, and uh, mostly because of the domestic instability in Moldova. Uh, so right now, Budapest is a very smaller partner than uh, partner of Moldova than it was, let's say, 10 years ago. There have been some, some, some good initiatives. Because Hungary has had no stakes in the Transnistrian conflict, there is, has been a quite unique project invented and facilitated by the Hungarians, the so-called Dniester Euroregion. What's the big story about the Dniester Euroregion? It involves territories of Moldova. It involves such Moldovan territories which are under uh, Transnistrian control right now. And it involves also some Ukrainian territories. So the Dniester Euroregion has been intended to foster cross-border and cross-conflict cooperation uh, in and around Transnistria. <coughs> Bridges have been rebuilt, roads have been reconstructed. It has been a small step, but still, still a good idea. Belarus. Kind of the opposite dynamics, like, uh, like with many other countries, and relations with Belarus support the assessment that 2014 has really been a turning point. Before 2014, Hungary did not do much in Belarus. For a long while, we didn't even have an embassy. Belarus had an embassy in Budapest, but Hungary did not have an embassy in Minsk. It was just opened in the, in the, in the 2000s. However, 2014 changed a lot, particularly in Belarus. I mean, after 2014, the Belarusian president and the Belarusian government started a very intensive policy of opening towards the West, normalizing relations with the Western countries, if not democratizing, but at least softening the regime a bit. Don't look at Belarus right now, it's presidential election campaign. 9th of August, we are going to have presidential election. These periods are always crazy. But since 2014, uh, Belarus has been doing a lot in opening towards the West in order to slightly carefully decrease its dependence on Russia. So the Belarusian motivation was clearly geopolitically motivated and also economically motivated. From the Hungarian side, motivations were not geopolitical, motivations were economic. Why? When the conflict in the Crimea took place and the war in Donbas started, uh, the EU introduced plenty of sanctions against Russia, economic sanctions. How did Russia react? Russia introduced economic counter sanctions, uh, which basically blocked the import of all, uh, not all, almost all agricultural products from the EU to Russia. You know the story, the, the Russian state agencies, Rospot, Rednadzor, and uh, they, they officially uh, find uh, veterinary and, and food safety problems, so they block the import. This is basically the same story that Russia has, been, has done so many times vis-a-vis -vis Georgia, vis-a-vis -vis Moldova. Since 2014, Russia is banning the import of European agricultural products. And this has caused massive damage to Hungary. Not, it's an interesting story. Um, Hungarian agriculture has never been a prominent element, sorry, agriculture has never been a prominent element 
to Hungarian exports to Russia. Hungarian exports to Russia has always been mostly composed of pharmaceutical products and machinery. Agriculture constituted around 8-9% of all the exports. So the loss should not have been that big. The problem is that these losses occurred to some very powerful figures of Hungarian politics, basically some of the most influential oligarchs. So even though numerically losses were not that big, these losses hurt such people who, were, who have been important in Hungarian politics. So the motivation was vis-a-vis -vis Belarus, that because we have the Eurasian Economic Union, if you can get into the Belarusian market, from then on, you can get to the Russian market. That's the logic. Since 2014, Hungary has been intensifying relations with Belarus, trade relations with Belarus, in order to get access to the Russian market. I mean, Belarusian market is not small, 9.5 million, but the Russian market is a lot bigger, 140 million. So this indirect access to the, to the Russian market is the main Hungarian economic motive, besides relations, behind relations with Belarus. And spectacular things have been taking place. Now Belavia is, uh, is flying to Budapest. A lot of bilateral investments are taking place. And Belarusian embassy has been doing a really active presence in, uh, in Hungary. So this relation is, is, uh, is very perspective. Also because the government of Viktor Orban is not the one that would lecture Belarus about democratic standards. Uh, and Belarusians like it. Very last slide, Ukraine. And remember what I said about the foreign policy and the, the use of veto. Ukraine is the big story in Hungarian policy towards the Eastern Partnership. Of all six Eastern Partnership countries, Hungary has only direct, is only direct neighbor of one of Ukraine. We have a short border section in the Northeast. Relations since 1991 has been largely pragmatic. Uh, but minority dimension has always been present. There are approximately 130,000 Hungarians living in the Zakarpatia region of Ukraine. Ukrainian minority, I mean, official Ukrainian minority in Hungary is very small, around 6,000 people, even less. But particularly since 2014, when many, many Ukrainians, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians lost their job, plus hundreds of thousands of Hungarians emigrated to the West, like myself. Ukrainian labor force, Gastarbaitiri, uh, is arriving to Hungary to greater and greater numbers. Right now, officially, there are some 40, 50,000 Ukrainian guest workers working in Hungary. Of course, summertime is higher because of agricultural jobs, winter time it's lower, but the presence and visibility of Ukrainians in Hungary is growing. So the solidarity dimension, I mean, the, the, the minority dimension, that yes, we have Hungarians there, and now we have more and more Ukrainians here. This is actually bringing the two countries to a unit. The problem is that, that the Ukrainian governments, which have been in power since 2014, uh, have adopted a number of such legislations which affected negatively the Hungarian minority. This means particularly the language law and the education law. Uh, from the Ukrainian side, the intention has not been to harm the Hungarians. Come on, Ukraine is a country of 40 million people. Who would care about such a small minority in the far southwestern end of Ukraine? Not much. I mean, Ukrainian legislation is not directed against the Hungarians. These Ukrainian legislations uh, are mostly designed to, uh, to push back the importance of, of Russian language and the Russian, uh, the Russian minority. So what's happening to the Hungarians, the negative effect on the Hungarians is largely a collateral damage. It's not something that Kiev intended to do. It's more that it's, it's really a collateral damage. And Ukraine is a country at war uh, since 2014. And yes, times of war, heavy-handed replies take place. Nevertheless, the important thing to understand or to keep in mind is that the language law and the education law have constituted important serious sources of tension between Budapest and Kiev. 
And besides bilateral negotiating these tensions, Budapest decided to elevate the story to EU and NATO level uh, and decided to block uh, high level NATO Ukraine ties and also high level initiatives uh, and agreements between uh, Ukraine and, uh, and the European Union. This has been the trend in the last five years. However, since Volodymyr Zelensky became president last year, the situation is getting gradually normalized. Hungarian government perceives President Zelensky as a partner with whom it's much easier to reach a pragmatic agreement than it was or would have been with previous president Petro Poroshenko. Uh, high level visits already took place. There was already a plan for a meeting between President Volodymyr Zelensky and Prime, uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orban in the spring uh, in Zakarpatia. This plan could not be realized because of the coronavirus, but the two foreign ministers already met, and it's quite likely that Orban and Zelensky are going to meet soon. That will hopefully settle most of the bilateral conflicts. But again, the general trend here is that by using veto power and by elevating bilateral tension to multilateral level, uh, Hungarian diplomacy is, uh, is doing something which has so far been quite unprecedented in the EU and NATO. We will see whether the trend, whether the trend contributes. So now we passed uh, bilateral relations with, uh, with all the six Eastern Partnership countries, of course, just as brief as the time frame allows us. Uh, and at this point, uh, I stop here and I would love to hear your questions and I'm ready to try and pass them. Thank you. Questions, comments, anything in the chat session? Uh, well, thank you, Andras. It was a very interesting and comprehensive presentation. Uh, I just uh, had a couple of small comments and maybe a larger one regarding the recent policy. Uh, you mentioned that opening to the east, which, as you say previously, that was not a priority in Hungarian politics, and I remember a publication in HVG magazine in 2015. I think uh, it was the Chinese dragon was painted there, and the, the caption said, like, we shall be old friends, if I remember correctly. And that's you do. one thing. That, yes, and uh, about the minorities, uh, for people in Armenia maybe who don't know, these uh, 13 minorities are, uh, they are officially designated or somehow designated as historical minorities. So while naturalized people of Chinese origin or Turkish are now also Vietnamese, I guess, are much more than Armenians or even more than Ukrainians. In Hungary, still, they don't have this autonomy rights. And uh, also not much people know, in 2014, a couple of Hungarian Armenians established a company in Yerevan, say, Hungaricum Limited Liability Company, with some backing from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, already led by Peter Siarto, mm -hmm. some maybe small support, financial or promises to back some loans, but it was not clear which kind of customs regime would be in Armenia from 2015 mm -hmm. with the Eurasian Union, and there were some other issues, but, but also lack of interest on both sides and so it didn't work, so the company is not active now. Still, if you Google it in Armenia, Hungary, Hungary LC, the interactive map shows the place where it had this legal address in Yerevan. Okay, thank you. I never heard about the story. Thank you. And regarding the policy towards Eastern Partnership. After the yes, 
video conference in June with EU foreign ministers and uh, their counterparts from the Eastern Partnership. I read a story on the Hungarian MFA website that it says there were four concrete, concrete proposals. One uh, giving the previously promised financial support to Moldova, then the comprehensive partnership agreement must be concluded with, with Azerbaijan, particularly in view of the fact that it is increasing the extraction of natural gas. And the third, lifting of sanctions against Belarus and uh, not blocking Georgia's approach towards NATO. And then also in July, after a meeting with the Georgian foreign minister, David Zalkaliani, that the Seattle also sort of green-lighted Georgia's NATO membership action plan. So in spite of the cautious approach towards Russia, is there any development in this way? No. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, really good questions, and I'm particularly grateful for this Hungaricum LTD company. I never heard about it. Uh, regarding your last question about Hungarian foreign policy, speaking about the need to lift sanctions against Belarus. Well, you know, Arman, this was something very hard to interpret. Because since 2016, most sanctions against Belarus are lifted. Let just check it. I mean, when, when Peter Sierto said that, many people in the expert community were kind of clueless what did he mean. Because since 2016, most of the EU sanctions against Belarus are not in place anymore. There are only two types of sanctions in place. First, there are personal sanctions against four individuals who have been involved in the political killings in the, in the 1990s and 2000s. Literally, four people, four quite shady people. So I don't really see why would it be of anybody's interest to lift sanctions against those people. And the second type of sanction is an arms embargo, which forbids uh, European countries and companies to sell arms or even such technologies that could be used for repressions to Belarus. And this is, again, I really cannot interpret uh, why it would make sense to lift the arms embargo against Belarus. I mean, I just cannot understand. And advocate, I mean, more the EU sanctions, which we had been, I mean, the EU sanctions that have been there before 2016, those were serious ones. A lot of individuals, a lot of companies, those sanctions caused considerable economic damage to Belarus. But the still present sanctions, I mean, visa ban against four individuals uh, and the arms embargo, content wise, it makes not much sense for me. So my, again, personal opinion that this was more a diplomatic gesture than a practical policy suggestion. Same with Georgia NATO membership action plan. I mean, if one takes, I mean, in the 2008 Bucharest summit, spring 2008, NATO committed itself that Georgia and Ukraine would once be members of the alliance. It's in the declaration. But there is no deadline. So it's a commitment, but not, but not that strong one. And here comes an important detail. If, if one looks at the history of NATO, NATO never takes in a country which has an ongoing territorial conflict, never. The European Union does, Cyprus could join, but the NATO never. And as long as the conflict uh, of Georgia's occupied regions, so Abkhazia and South Ossetia are not solved, it's quite unlikely, practically impossible, that Georgia would ever make it to the alliance. And at this point, speaking about uh, giving Georgia a membership action plan, again, this is just a diplomatic gesture, it's not a policy suggestion. Membership action plan in the current situation makes no sense. His membership action plan directly leads towards membership, but because NATO never takes account of the territorial conflict, Georgia, it's not realistic to see Georgia as a member of the alliance. 
So at this point, I have no other choice than, than interpreting Minister Seattle's remarks as, as empty diplomatic talk, nothing else. Uh, when it comes to your question on the minorities and the situation of the Chinese and Vietnamese groups, mostly Chinese, who've been present in Hungary uh, since the 1990s, and in terms of numbers, they are way bigger than, than any other minorities. The reason why they still do not get the official minority status, that is that in order to become an official minority, it's not only the size of the group that matters, but also the time since when the group has been present in Hungary. You have to be present at least for 100 years. This is, this is not something that stands for the Chinese. So even though there are a lot of Chinese people living in Hungary, many of them got naturalized. Uh, second generation of, uh, of Chinese minority people already come to Hungarian schools, they, but they speak perfect Hungarian. Uh, it's still some 70 years for them to become a, a, a recognized national minority because this 100 years uh, requirement is still there. Same is true for the Vietnamese. Fun fact, Russians tried to become a recognized national minority um, because their argument was that in the end of the First World War, so many Russian soldiers, Tsarist Russian soldiers, were taken I mean, captured by the Hungarians and brought to Hungary as prisoners of war, and many of them stayed. I mean, we speak about thousands of people here. Because Tsarist Russia collapsed, civil war started. Anyways, these, these Russian guys, most of them simple peasants uh, who were brought to Hungary and as prisoners of war, they were made to work in the fields, usually in small villages. Many of these guys decided to stay. They learned the language, usually married Hungarian women, and they just stayed. Didn't want to go there, uh, and just got integrated into Hungarian society, which was anyways quite turbulent after the First World War. And Russia argued, Putin's Russia argued, that because of these Russians who have been there on Hungary since the end of the First World War, the 100 years requirement is met. So Russia can become a recognized national minority. Um, Hungarian Academy of Sciences said no. But there was, because this was not a substantiated claim, and these people, these prisoners of war, have not been present as a national minority, but only as individuals absolutely disorganized. And this was not continuous anyways. <coughs> Plus, speaking about the Russian presence in Hungary in the communist period, when Hungary was basically occupied by the Soviet Union, this is not such a type of presence that would actually count as something more. Uh, so Russians did not become a recognized national minority. And when it comes to opening towards the East and the role of China, yes, big capital, yes. Right now, the Eastern opening doctrine is mostly already about China. Before 2014 and before the problems of the Russian economy and before the, the dropping of oil prices and before the Crimea, Eastern Partnership Doctrine was about Russia and China. Right now, it's mostly about China. We still don't know how the coronavirus and the mixed experiences with Chinese medical equipment uh, is going to change that. What we do know is that somewhat similar to the situation with Russia, Hungary just got engaged in a massive, really large project with China. Uh, this is the so-called Belgrade-Budapest railway line. There will be a cargo railway line built between Belgrade and Budapest uh, from a huge Chinese loan, more than 750 billion Hungarian forints. Uh, so huge Chinese loan and the railway line is going to be built by Chinese companies. And Chinese companies will, of course, use Hungarian subcontractors. So far, uh, the Hungarian subcontractors we know are pretty close to the ruling elite. So it's quite visible that some people in the ruling elite will find their money in this railway line project. But again, similarly to 
like the Pax nuclear power plant constitutes a long time binding and long time dependence in Hungarian Russian relations. And the Budapest Belgrade railway line constitutes a similarly strong dependency in Hungarian China relations. Uh, so, my prediction is that even if the enthusiasm vis a vis China might decrease because of the coronavirus, this long term dependence manifested in the railway line is going to stay. I hope this, this is your answer. Other questions from participants, people okay, in chat, people in live stream. Well, I had a written question from a participant whose mic probably doesn't work. A Moldovan colleague, uh, we've been discussing uh, a possible joint project on uh, civilian security, and uh, he wanted to ask. So, uh, what's your perception about the Eastern Partnership countries, or perhaps about Moldova in particular? Although, the as the police and border guard have been going through several stages of reform um, and uh, in Moldova as far as I understood from the text it's based on Estonia's experience so uh, the question is how does the police cooperate or what is the way for it to collaborate with the business so with the economic agents taking into account the uh, regional and international instability related in, to illegal migration and human trafficking and what's the general situation in the EU according to Frontex data. So what's the state of affairs? Thank you for the question Mark. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I think the honest way is to say openly that I'm not that much an expert on Moldova and particularly other policing issues. So I'm not the right person to ask on that. And uh, speaking about things I do not know is not usually something that I do. I mean, I leave it to politicians to speak about whatever. Uh, so the only thing I would like to say here when it comes to Frontex data and particularly the migration challenge, uh, when Moldova got the, associate, the, the, the visa-free regime with the EU, I remember that there were a lot of concerns uh, that with this visa-free, a lot of Moldovan criminals and illegals and you know criminals, prostitutes, whomever, would just pour into the European Union. So one year after the visa facilitation agreement came to force, uh, researchers led by Leonid Litra, of Moldovan origin, who works right now in Kiev, they made an assessment about one year, first year of the visa-free regime, and how about growing criminality or growing influx of Moldovan illegals to the EU. And the research showed that nothing like this happened. Of course, in the very beginning, the number of unsuccessful border crossings grew a bit because it took time for Moldovans to learn that visa-free applies only if you have a biometric passport. A lot of people tried to use visa-free with the old passport, of course, they couldn't use it. But the study revealed that visa-free regime did not result in the increase of any kind of Moldovan uh, criminality-related activities. So from this perspective, visa-free regime has clearly been a success. But when it comes to, to police cooperation and, and, uh, and police and, 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 and business entities, I'm, I'm truly sorry, I'm not, not an expert on that. I cannot, I cannot reply you. Sorry for that. Well, thank you. I guess with the visa-free regime, so far the biggest problem that some EU members raised the, the issue that was that there were false claims of political persecution, so people wanted to get uh, refugee status, some people, but not Moldovans, I guess. No, 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 no. And particularly since the migrate, I mean, the, the year 2015 has been breaking point in terms of asylum policy and migration policy. You all know the story, the 2015 migration wave, which brought in basically like almost 2 million people into the European Union. And yes, among those people, there have been ones who falsely claimed 
that they've been subject to political prosecution, so they wanted to get uh, asylum. Most of them could be filtered out. But yes, Armen, I fully agree. One of the biggest problems is, is false claims of political or religious or other prosecutions. I mean, there are a lot of people approaching particularly the southern border uh, who claim to be Afghans, uh, who claim to be Syrians, but in fact, they come from other parts of the Middle East. A proper vetting process in the border is able to identify the people who, who try to, to play such tricks. It's possible to filter them out. And if they are not eligible for political asylum, then of course, a different way of handling applies. I know it from, from close personal experience. During the 2015 migration wave, the best way to filter out or to identify whether the person was really from Syria or not, interpreters. Interpreters of Arabic language who could distinguish between Syrian dialect, Tunisian dialect, Libyan dialect, Iraqi dialect. So came the person to the border from the south, claimed that he's a Syrian refugee, but he spoke Arabic, let's say with a Moroccan accent. Sorry, that's not gonna fly. There have been a lot of such cases. Other people claim themselves to be Afghans from, uh, from the Pashto territories, but the person did not speak a single word in Pashto language. Of course, there are such, uh, such tries, such efforts. Uh, but I fully agree with Armin's assessment. Moldovans are not, are not the ones engaged in, in, uh, in these types of schemes. So for Georgia, Moldova and Ukraine, this was not a real issue that visa-free caused a big problem. Uh, did I understand that right? Uh, for these three countries? Uh, I mean, if uh, I did not check Frontex data, but it is, but, but all of you can do it. If you go on Frontex website, uh, Frontex publishes so-called quarterly reviews, so four times published every year. And there you find uh, the main migration challenges, also the numbers of illegal crossings. So Frontex data is pretty reliable. I don't have it, have it by heart, I can check it for you. The only particularity with Frontex data is that it gets published always with a delay. So let's say in this year, we don't have the second quarter uh, data yet. We have only data of the fourth quarter of 2019. So real data gets published only some, some months later, but that's the best, best, that's the best information everybody has and it's fully public and it's accessible. So for those ones who are interested in, in migration related data, let it be legal or, legal or illegal migration, I strongly recommend Frontex data, it's a good source. Thank you. Uh, thank does anybody have a question? Because we still have some time. So, okay, I'm waiting. Hey, yeah, me too, for a few seconds only. Well, uh, let's see, there are not some patients, so I'm just maybe comment about my experience in 2012 or just what happened before because I remember how at a lot of conferences at CUL and elsewhere where I participated before the Safari extradition, there was somebody from the Azerbaijani embassy always, one of the diplomats, and they opened the embassy soon after the murder case in 
2004. And, and because of CU's and other academic communities negative assessment of what happened in 2012. Since then, I haven't met, uh, again, I've been there for years and visited a lot of events, haven't met any from Azerbaijan embassy anymore. And maybe they even lost the interest, I don't know. Actually, yes. Uh, Azerbaijan embassy greatly downgraded its activities in Budapest since the Safarov case. They still are engaged in cultural projects, of course, translation of Azerbaijan literature to Hungarian and things like this. But uh, their their activity has downgraded considerably, partially since the Safarov case, and also since diplomatic, so sorry, economic relations have become less intensive. Azerbaijani embassy has that thing, less things to do. But I agree, and my memories are the same. Before 2012, they were really, really active, everywhere present, organizing a lot of things. Now it's different. Yes, and uh, for a few years after freezing the diplomatic relations, uh, there was a period when Armenian students could not get the Hungarian state scholarship. But since last year, 2018, uh, there were a little change, maybe four or five places at the Agricultural University in Gödöllő, one and some one or the, another university with, uh, in the field of engineering and so on. But for example, Georgians get about 100 paid scholarships a year. So, uh, well, I agree that. Unless there is an apology, uh, there will be no restoration of diplomatic relations. But as I also suggested to some people who are doing a survey on this in Hungary, more than a year ago now, some academic and cultural cooperation perhaps could help to start understanding each other better in the, in the longer term. Although I also feel that there will be no apology in the visible future and so no diplomatic relations is taught. I agree. And when it comes to, to non-political projects, let it be, I mean, the best example, of course, is, uh, is like student exchange and providing scholarships to, to Armenia students. Uh, the best framework, which hosts really a lot of Georgians, really a lot of Armenians, Azerbaijanis, Russians, is the so-called Stipendium Hungaricum uh, Fellowship. I'll just type here the name in, uh, in the chat. Stipendium Hungaricum. And for Stipendium Hungaricum, students basically from all parts of the world are eligible. Uh, and in the Stipendium Hungaricum, it's possible to come uh, and study in Budapest. All the courses are covered by the Hungarian state situation fee and, and such. Uh, and even some, some moderate scholarship is given. Another option, which is not bilateral, but multilateral, is the, the fellowships provided by the International Visegrad Fund. The website is visegradfund.org. Uh, and if one goes, again, in the chat, if one goes on the Visegrad Fund website, there you find the scholarships provided by the Visegrad Fund to uh, universities in the Visegrad region. And with the Visegrad framework, it's possible to come to Hungary, uh, also for Armenian students. So this is, this is another opportunity. As a former university lecturer, and as, uh, after my job in Germany is going to end, probably I go back to teach the university at least for a few years, uh, personally, I would be happy to see a lot more students from, from Eastern Partnership countries because it's beneficial both for them and also for the Hungarian students and also for the Western students we have usually by Erasmus Fellowship from France, Spain, Germany, all the countries. So uh, I would really welcome to see groups more mixed 
So not just EU students, but also students from uh, from Eastern partnership countries, including Armenia, because it would, it would enrich on all of them. And my, my, my particular case, I mean, the subjects I teach are mostly related to, to the post-Soviet region, to, to Russia, to Eastern partnership region, regional conflicts, all that. And if you have students in the group who are from the given country, so who have the insider's view, all other students can learn a lot from, from those people who know the story from the inside. I mean, the best seminars I ever had about regional conflicts have been the ones in which we had students from the Crimea, students from both sides of the Donbass. We could learn a lot, I could learn a lot. So personally, uh, I would be very happy to see more students from, from Eastern Partnership countries. When it comes to bilateral framework, this stipendium Hungaricum is a good one. And for multilateral frameworks, International Research Fund. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, so the last chance maybe to ask questions. If no one reacts, then may conclude the meeting soon. They just want to have lunch. <laughs> uh, maybe. So. Uh, so, Andras, thank you once again for joining us today. And so this was the last of four events in the first module of our program and from September we will start events dealing with some sectoral issues so in order to support or to provide know-how for sectoral reforms and, and I hope that those who've been following the live video as well may join us again and absolutely let's stay in touch Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you very much, Armin and dear colleagues. Thank you for, for the attention. And again, thank you for hosting me. All the best, stay safe. Goodbye. Thank you, goodbye.